been in the study of the Ten Commandments now for a, a good while. Some commandments involve a little more explanation than others, but uh, today we're going to back up to the Fifth Commandment. We looked at the Sixth Commandment, uh, and uh, I saved the fifth one because I knew Mother's Day was coming up soon, and this would kind of relate to that. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, is the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Let's look and see what Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 says. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Probably every one of you in here has heard that commandment before whether you knew it was in the Ten Commandments or not. And there was a newspaper editor who decided that he would print one of the Ten Commandments every day for 10 successive days in his newspaper. And at the completion of his printing of those Ten Commandments, a reader wrote in and said, please cancel my subscription. Your paper is getting too personal. <laughs> so, but they do, the commandments are personal. In these 10 commandments, God has given basic morality in crystal clear, simple, easy to understand language. It's not hard to figure out. And today, for whatever reason, there's a great deal of moral ambiguity, that there's uncertainty in contemporary morals. You know, maybe it's right, Maybe it's wrong. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. You know what I'm saying? But when you read the Ten Commandments, you'll find that God gives moral absolutes. With a few words in these commandments, God establishes acceptable human behavior, not only for that day back then, but for our day and for all time. So as we come to the commandments that have to do with our relationships to each other, it's interesting and instructive to recognize that the first of these commandments has to do with our relationship with our parents. They are the first people with whom we have to do. You need to learn to get along with your father and mother, because if you can't learn to get along with your family, then you're going to have problems getting along with anyone else in society. The family is the basic structure of human civilization, and it all begins right there. So God, in his infinite wisdom, begins by saying, honor your father and your mother. Now, I realize that the times we live in present us with difficult situations that include things like divorce and remarriage, single parenting, foster parenting, adoption, stepchildren, abuse, abandonment, adultery, homosexual unions, and before too long, probably polygamy. I mean, who knows where all this is going. And the further we get from the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and the longer our own nation continues to reject God and his ways, we're going to continue to reap brokenness and corruption. And I say all of that to say this, that as I bring this message to you this morning, my approach to this commandment is based upon what I believe to be God's original design and plan and purpose for human flourishing based upon the word of God. So the angle I take with this assumes that God's plan for marriage is for one, way, one man to be married to one woman for a lifetime till death do they part. It also assumes that children are a blessing from the Lord. If the Lord allows you to have children, the best and preferred environment for that is in that marriage of the one man to the one woman within the bonds of marriage. That's the ideal. That's also, uh, that marriage is also to be the only place where sexual activity is to occur. So you can, call me a fuddy-duddy or a stick in the mud or old-fashioned, but I just call it being biblical. 
God doesn't change and his word doesn't change and truth doesn't change no matter how much the culture around us might change. So I'm coming at this today, this commandment about honoring your father and your mother from what I believe is the biblical ideal. I realize it's not always, not always what is actual or real. I grant that. And, and listen, God is more than able to redeem imperfect people and situations for his glory and our good. God does that all the time. Bad things happen. People are mean. People can hurt us. People can be ignorant. They can be stupid and make bad choices. And because of that, sometimes we need to make adjustments in our lives that are difficult because relationships are strained or something bad has happened and we know that our decision or someone else's decision will impact us in a way that comes up short of God's ideal. And that's where we all live. That's where we all exist. But the thing is, we have to do it. We have to make an adjustment. We have to make a decision. We can't see any other way. So we make a decision that we wished we never would have had to make. But again, just understand, I'm trying to uphold God's ideal not to make anyone feel bad. God uses remarriages. God uses single parent families, foster homes, adoption, and other situations to his glory all the time. So our God is redeeming God, and the Bible is full of stories of how he redeems people and situations for his glory and their good. So. That's where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm looking at it on one perspective from, from God's ideal and on the other perspective from our reality. You know what I'm saying? Kind of trying to thread that needle. So I guess what I would begin with saying is that there are no perfect marriages. Um, there are no perfect parents. There are no perfect children and there are no perfect churches. The only one who is perfect is God. And we should strive to be like him. And the only way to do that is with his spirit living within us, which comes to us, to, comes to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and again, as I preach to you all today, I have to also keep in mind that right now at Emmanuel, our congregation is older. Not many kids attend right now, and we pray that will change. And many of you have parents who have already died and gone on to glory. And some of you have come from broken homes and broken marriages, and I realize that, but, but just try to hang with me as we walk through what I see as a biblical perspective on the fifth commandment. So I wanna start out by sharing with you a quote from an old preacher, an old North Carolina preacher, uh, Vance Havner. Some of you may have heard of him from, from back when. Here's something Vance Havner shared. It's, it's sort of a little poem story kind of thing. Junior bit the meter man Junior kicked the cook. Junior's antisocial now, according to the book. Junior smashed the clock and lamp. Junior hacked the tree. Destructive trends are treated in chapters two and three. Junior threw his milk at mom. Junior screamed for more. Notes on self-assertiveness are found in chapter four. Junior tossed his shoes and socks out into the rain. Negation that and normal, disregard disdain. Junior got in grandpa's room and tore up his fishing line. That's to get attention, see page 89. But grandpa grabbed a slipper and yanked Junior across his knee cause grandpa hasn't read a book since 1893. <laughs> So 
First of all, this morning, let's think about the role of being a parent. Because being a parent, first of all, is a biological matter. Mothers and fathers have made it possible for us to have existence. And kids, wherever you are listening today, there's really not too many here. But kids did not have a thing in the world to do with choosing their parents, neither did you. No choice in the matter. You didn't have a vote. You didn't go to a store and see moms and dads on display and then choose one. Oh, yeah, I'll take that. On the other hand, kids, your parents did not choose you either. Once upon a time, you were one of 50 million sperm cells lined up in a long canal in a race to locate an egg. And out of all the hundred, out of all the 50 million cells, congratulations, you won the race. You came into existence. And don't think for a moment that that was an accident because it wasn't. It wasn't by chance. In fact, the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16, the psalmist says this, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. So it was not an accident, it wasn't by chance. When you were conceived, God was there and God allowed you to be born. And most of us were raised by our biological parents. Some were raised by adoptive parents. But as a parent, you have a responsibility for the physical care of your children. You have the responsibility to, to guard them, to guide them, to care for them and, and to meet their needs. In fact, there was a story about a little boy who presented his mother with a bill. It said, washing the car, $5. Taking out the garbage, $5. Total, you owe me $10. So at the next meal, the mother put a bill on the boy's plate. And it said, washing your clothes, $5. Preparing your meal, $5. Taking care of you when you're sick, $5. Getting you to school on time, $5. Total, I love you. Now, isn't it great that you have someone in this world who loves you and is interested in you? God has given you parents. They're able to give you a quality of life that no one else can offer. And included in that is the gift of experience. One of the reasons children have parents is because parents have experience. They're supposed to know some things you don't. They've been around. The fact that your parents have already been down the road means that they can give you helpful advice and counsel as you head down the road. That's what every parent needs to do. So not only is parenting a biological matter, but it's also an emotional matter. It's not enough simply to bring children into the world. It's not because you can produce a baby that makes you or qualifies you to be a parent. Being able to produce a baby biologically does not mean you're a successful parent or that you're even qualified to be one. There's also an emotional responsibility to being a parent. Children are a lot like a blank piece of paper. And as they grow and learn and experience things in life, those things are recorded on that paper. And the only problem is, is that it can never be erased. So moms and dads, be very careful what you write upon the lives of your children. It will go with them for the rest of their lives. And what our boys and girls become emotionally to a great extent will be what you and I as parents have engraved upon their lives. 
We have the responsibility to love our children and give them emotional support. And then when the day comes, we're to let loose of our children with our hopes, ambitions, and our prayers. So being a parent is a biological matter and an emotional matter, but it's also a spiritual matter. And the first concept that a child has of God is picked up from their parents. That's a sobering thought, if you think about it. When we speak of God as our father, and then we think of the fatherly examples many children have, it's scary. I mean, what an awesome responsibility before God it is to be a parent. In fact, the Bible teaches that the parents are responsible for the religious training of their children. Just read Deuteronomy chapter six and you'll see. And you know, thank God for Sunday school, thank God for faithful teachers and for Sunday worship. Those things are great, but the responsibility for the spiritual training of children is that of the parent. And it's also important for families to pray together, not just at mealtime, but at various times, reading the Bible, reading stories together, talking about God, learning verses, asking your children what they learned about in Sunday school or worship. What did the preacher talk about? Um, and then you tell them what you learned. You know, have a conversation. Do this and you'll bring the blessing of God upon your family. Put scripture verses up on the walls of your house. Keep the things of God before your children. Be a good example to them by faithfully attending Sunday school and worship, prayer services and other meetings of the church. Teach your children to seek the Lord. So let's look closer at this commandment to honor your father and mother. Well, it's interesting, and we'll put a, a slide up here on the screen. What does it mean to honor and obey? Because you will find the fifth commandment repeated in the New Testament. It's in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, and it's in Colossians 3, 20. So why is that repeated in the New Testament? Well, the New Testament says it's because it's right. It's well-pleasing to the Lord. In fact, I'll just read what Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So the word honor means to give weight to, means to hold in high esteem. And there's a twofold application of this in Ephesians 6. There's the matter of obedience, and then there's the matter of honor. To obey means that children are to respond to their parents. The word obey literally means to hear under, and it carries the concept of authority. The children in the family are to answer to the authority of their parents. God has established authority in every area of life. There's authority in government, in church, and in the family. So obey your parents, listen to your parents. It's the responsibility of parents to teach their children to obey because in doing so, they teach the child to obey authority wherever he finds it. So if you fail as a parent to teach your child to obey you, that simply means that everywhere they go, they're going to have problems with authority. If you don't teach them to obey it in your home, when they go to school, they're gonna have problems obeying the teacher. When they go out into society, they're gonna have problems obeying the officials and the authority of the government. When they go to work, and a supervisor tells them what to do, they're gonna have problems responding to that authority. Why? Because they've never learned authority. Well, maybe you ask the question, do I have to obey my parents in every circumstance? No. The Bible says to obey them in the Lord. Now, what does that mean? If your parents tell you to kill somebody, obviously you don't obey. If your parents tell you to steal something, you certainly don't obey. 
It, you obey in the Lord. A parent is called on to be the type of parent that makes it easy for the children to obey him or her because they are following the Lord and his word. A parent must be the type of parents uh, that the child will love and respect enough to obey. Also, that passage in Ephesians continues and says that you fathers don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Parents are not supposed to provoke their children to wrath and anger. Don't push them so hard that they get discouraged. Don't make it impossible for them to do anything right, to do anything that pleases you. Like if they make all C's, well, you should have had all B's or had B's. And if they make all B's, they should have had A's. And if they made A's, then they should have had all A's. And when the parents are unpleasable and impossible, the children can lose heart and give up and figure what's the use. So parents need to balance criticism with praise. There ought to be more strokes than pokes, more bragging than nagging. Your children learn what you teach them at home. And if you teach them criticism, they learn to condemn. If you teach them hostility, they learn to fight. If you teach them patience, they learn to be understanding. And if you teach them praise, they learn to be appreciative. If you teach them security, they'll learn to trust. And you have a great deal to do with whether or not your children obey you. So the commandment says to honor your father and mother, but also note what it does not say. It does not say until you're 18. <laughs> I think that's what a lot of kids think that, well, I'll just get old enough to vote or drink or move out of the home or join the military or whatever. And then at that point, I don't have to honor my father and mother anymore. Well, yes, you do. Uh, the concept of honor goes beyond the teenage years and young adulthood. One of these days, most of you kids that are listening to me, which right now is very few, but maybe online, who knows? One of these days you're going to get married. And when you get married, you will establish your home and be a new center of authority. You will no longer be under the authority of your parents, but the command to honor your parents continues on beyond the time you're no longer under their authority. You might not be under their authority, but they are still your father and your mother. That doesn't change. You say, well, what if my parents aren't honorable? What if one's parents are not worthy of being honored? Well, consider this. Sometimes a person goes to court and stands in front of a bench and addresses the judge as your what? Your honor. Now that doesn't say a thing about the kind of individual that the judge is. People acknowledge the authority of his position as judge by saying your honor. The Bible commands you to honor your parents if for no other reason than for the fact that they are your parents. And by the way, kids, there are no perfect parents and only perfect children have a right to demand perfect parents. Is that fair enough? <laughs> okay. So here's something to think about. Children pass through four stages in life. There, first of all, is they idolize their parents. Daddy can do anything. He could fly me to the moon if he wanted to. Dad can do everything and anything. Then there's the demonize their parents stage. When they reach the point where they realize their mom and dad are not perfect, they demonize their parents. Mom and dad are the source of all the miseries and all the troubles of the world, right? And then the kids become a little bit smarter and move into the stage where they utilize their parents. 
Hey, Dad, can I have the keys to the car? Mom, would you wash this shirt for me? So they use their parents. And if you grow to the maturity God desires for you, you will arrive at the fourth stage where you humanize your parents. You will realize that they are neither God nor the devil, nor things to be used. They are human and have their strong and weak points just like you. So think about it. For all their faults, they probably made some real sacrifices for you. Who else would put up with you like they did? Have you thought about what your parents may have sacrificed for you? Because they have you. There are trips they might have passed up. Money they could have spent on themselves. Instead, they spent it on you for clothes, for food, for school, for other expenses, for doctor visits and medicine. They did it because they care for you. So honor your father and mother. That's what the fifth commandment says. There may be some 60 year old children here today who need to forgive their parents. I don't know where you're at or what your story is. You need to realize that they weren't perfect and they had their faults. Maybe, maybe you are unjustly holding animosity in your heart against them and you need to forgive them. You say, well, you don't know what they did to me. And I don't. But ultimately it's not important what they did to you. What is important is how you responded to what they did. Some of you kids may be ashamed of your parents right now. You don't even want your friends around because you're embarrassed by your parents. Were you ever like that as a kid? <laughs> so throw away the magnifying glass, quit expecting perfection out of your parents and honor your father and mother. This is a commandment that continues all the days of your life. You see, when you grow older, the roles tend to reverse themselves. There comes a point where the children almost assume the role of the parent and the parent steps into the role of the child. In fact, the Bible teaches that you have a responsibility to care for your parents. And Paul says, if you claim to be saved, but don't live it out at home, you're a sham. You can't play holier than now at church and then be like the devil at home. The Bible says to show piety at home, to be a Christian at home, because if you haven't got it at home, you haven't got it at church, no matter what mask you might wear. Now, there could come a time as you care for your parents that you need to render financial assistance to them. And if you're in that situation right now, God bless you for caring and helping your parents because you're gonna be glad you did. Maybe some of you ought to call or write your parents today. You ought to thank them. So obey them in your younger years, support them in their older years, and honor them in all of their years. You say, well, pastor, my parents have already died. What should I do? Well, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. How you relate to your children and how you relate to others in your family and the example you can try to set for others. It's about being respectful and honoring. It doesn't mean that you approve, that you affirm or bless them carte blanche in everything they do. It's sort of like the office of president of the United States. Consider that you have President Biden and you have President Trump. And I'm sure some of you here prefer one of them over the other. But if any U.S. president walked in through these doors into this sanctuary, it would be an honor for us to meet him and have him here because of the office he holds and the significance of that moment, despite whether you agree or disagree with his policies. It would be an honor. Agree or disagree, we should honor. So what is the result? Well, the promise was to the Hebrew children would be that if they would be obedient and would honor their parents, God would bless them with a long life in the promised land. 
That's still true today. If you show me a nation where there's disobedience to parents, and I'll show you a nation whose foundations are crumbling. No nation is going to last very long, which is characterized by disobedience to parents. In fact, there's two scriptures in the New Testament that are a list of, of sins and things that are wrong. And the first one is uh, Romans 1, 28 to 32. I don't know how well you can see that. But right in the middle of that list of these vices is disobedient to parents. And that's Romans 1, 30. And then there's, uh, I think it's actually 2 Timothy. I think I typed 1 Timothy by accident. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And then again in the middle of that list of things you shouldn't be is disobedience to parents. So as we close up this morning, as I've already said, none of us are perfect. In fact, the Bible says that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all broken the Ten Commandments. And we're all therefore under the sentence of eternal death received as wages for our sin. But the Bible also says the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is yours as a free gift if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Eternal life is a result of salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he died on an old Roman cross, the death that you and I deserve because of our sin. We broke God's law but Jesus paid our fine. And today, if you will have him as your Lord and Savior, by repenting of your sin and trusting in him, like you would trust in a parachute if you knew you had to jump out of an airplane. If you will trust in Jesus who rose from the dead, you will be saved, the Bible says. The Bible also says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. So I'm gonna pray now and then we'll close out the service with a song followed by some announcements.